So excited to see each of you for this. I, I'm not sure how I got roped into doing uh, this welcome this evening. I thought all I had to do was open the doors, but uh, I was told, nope, you need to get up and say a few words. So let's start with this. A man walks into a bar. There's a duck, a penguin. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Wrong crowd, wrong crowd, wrong crowd. No, we're so excited to have each of you this evening. We're so thankful for the Durr family uh, and the descendants of the Durr family for keeping uh, the tradition alive. This is a tremendously valuable institution, uh, and we are so happy here at First Baptist. I am Reverend Freeman Ray, the pastor uh, here at the historic First Baptist Church, and we welcome you into this space. Uh, we're thankful for your presence this evening. We are not going to uh, tarry and delay much longer. Uh, if you would allow for me, we are in a church. I would like to at least open this evening up with prayer. If you would allow for me to do that, we will get to the portion of who you came to see this evening. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this called and divine time for uh, this group to come together to hear and listen uh, to, to gather, uh, not just in your name, but gathering, uh, dealing with issues of civil rights, dealing with issues of legal affairs pertaining to civil rights. Uh, and we're thankful, Lord, for you allowing that to happen in this place for the church. Uh, played such a pivotal role in the entire civil rights movement for civil rights uh, spawned from the church as they deal with issues of the heart. We pray, Lord, for every individual that is represented here this evening. We pray for the families that are represented, and we pray for the continuation of the struggle for equality for all. I ask now, Lord, that you touch and bless and anoint our speaker this evening. Uh, allow her, Father, to speak freely and, and to have words of wisdom that impart upon these, your people, that we might leave here better than we came in. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've got your programs in front of you, and we are going to operate simply as the programs are. Uh, this evening calls for uh, the introduction of our speaker of the hour, so I shall not uh, tarry long in that. But I always say, you know when somebody is the man or the woman when they're introducing somebody, and you've got to introduce the introducer. <laughs> The introducer uh, this evening is uh, our, our very own uh, Judge Myron Thompson. I, I asked him yesterday, and of course, you, I, I told him, I said, if there's anything that you would want the people to know about you as I introduce you, what would you want them to know? He said, Reverend, you can tell them that I am one of the last people alive who knew the Durr family very well. Well, that, I heard him, and that resonated for a while, and I went home, and I said, well, I wonder what he means by that. I said, let me see if I can dig into a little bit of, he's a public figure, he's a middle district judge, I, I can find whatever I need online about him. And then I saw the age that was listed near him, I said, oh, that's what he meant by that. And I said, judge, you don't look as old as Wikipedia says you are. He said, well, Reverend, I've got a couple of miles on me, but it is with great pleasure uh, that we present to you uh, to introduce our speaker of the hour, the esteemed, the honorable Judge Myron Thompson. In our lives, we are sometimes fortunate to come across people who make things change. They change not only us and our destinies, but they change the destinies of many. Almost 43 years ago, I met such a person. I had just been appointed to the bench at the extremely young age of 33. And this person graciously volunteered to host a party for me. I had heard of her from many, including even my mother. I had also heard of her husband. She and her husband were people who were so famous that there was even folklore about them. I had heard of her husband the Alabamian who had gone on to be a Rhodes Scholar, who was part of the Franklin Roosevelt administration, but who had resigned from the FCC after dissenting from the adoption of the loyalty oath that was demanded, but who willingly took on the representation as a lawyer of other federal employees who lost their jobs 
as a result of that loyalty oath program, sometimes charging them nothing. And who most famously, along with his wife, posted the bond for Rosa Parks. He was bigger than life, but I never met him. But on this occasion, almost 43 years ago, I did meet her. I did meet his wife. She was a close friend of Eleanor Roosevelt and such controversial figures as Aldra Hiss and Jessica Mitford and all of those who were ready and willing to speak their minds no matter what. But above all, she was a deep friend and confidant of Rosa Parks. This woman I met that day, 43 years ago, was the stuff of legends. She was even called before the senatorial committee because she did not openly condemn communism. At the committee hearing, she gave her name, assured the members she was not a communist, and refused to answer any more questions. She was a classic Southern lady, albeit one with the conscience deeply rooted in the Constitution. I don't know how many of you have seen that picture of Virginia there where she's fanning herself while she's saying, no, I will not answer. <laughs> of course I am talking about the Durrs, Clifford and Virginia. And I cannot rest my comments about the Durrs without acknowledging their daughter Lula, with whom my wife Anne and I deeply I became very close to and developed a wonderful friendship back here in Montgomery. Almost 43 years later, I am now in the presence of another person who makes things change, who changes the destinies of many, many people. Of course, I could note that she has had two gubernatorial appointments as well as two nominations by two different United States presidents, and was even considered a potential nominee for the United States Supreme Court. She now sits on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. She holds her undergraduate degree in management from the University of South Florida Honors College, a law degree from the University of South Carolina School of Law, a master's in personnel and employment relations from the University of South Carolina's Darla Moore School of Business, a master's of judicial studies from Duke University School of Law, and an honorary doctorate degree in public service from the University of South Carolina. And just so that in case my mom is watching and uh, she does, she's also a Delta. And like me, she was also a Jack and Jiller. But all this is to know of her. It is not to know her. For those of us who have gotten to know her, she is one of those who we say has presence. She has charm. She has grace. She has brilliance. She has insight. I began my introduction with the words that in our lives, we are sometimes fortunate to come across people who make things change. They change not only us and our destiny and destinies, but the destinies of many. Of many. Such were the Durrs back then, and such is our speaker tonight. I now introduce to you Judge Michelle Child. Good evening, <laughs> and thank you, Judge Thompson, for that very warm and gracious introduction. Unfortunately, my mother fell ill, but I would have loved for her to hear all of that and not be reminded of my childhood. <laughs> 
as I listened to those remarks, a feeling of humility came over me as I realized that I am the person you just described. But I'm not a hero. I'm here because I stand on your shoulders and the many other judicial luminaries that have come before me who have each sacrificed so much to provide me with this honor speaking to all of you this evening. Tonight, I will highlight seven dissimilar judges who during the most daunting moments of the civil rights movement helped to desegregate the South based on the legal principle that separate but, un, but equal is unconstitutional. You may not know all their names, but because they held steadfast to their faithful allegiance to the Constitution, despite raging social unrest and threats of violence, the rule of law was able to thrive and spread throughout the South. These judges had no political agenda, they just accepted their awesome responsibilities as members of our co-equal branch of government to be neutral arbiters of the law without fear or favor to any party. Before I tell you their stories, many thanks are in order. To Lula, who I got to meet over this weekend, the Durr's daughter, and James Lyon and Elizabeth McBride, two of Clifford and Virginia Durr's grandchildren and the many great grandchildren that I've had the uh, most honor to meet. The namesake of this lecture, which started back in 1992, I thank you so much for inviting me to this year's event. You all are worthy of the highest praise for keeping your legacy alive. To Pastor Ray and First Lady, I want to thank them for extending us this beautiful opportunity to be in this place of worship. We will celebrate the victories of the civil rights struggle as well as to reflect upon the setbacks. I want you and your family to know that you should continue to be blessed as you deliver continually your soulful messages. To the judges, professors, lawyers, authors, members of the public, all of who have joined in this weekend's festivities, thank you for continuing to celebrate with us tonight. And of course, thank you to my husband Floyd, my daughter Juliana, my law clerk Donovan Hicks, who helped with a lot of the logistics here, Pro uh, Professor Patricia Sullen, and my dear friend Judge Richard Gurgel, for your leadership in making this event possible. I've also got several family members here, as well as dear friends who have traveled far from South Carolina, my beholden home, and from all corners of the country, including our Chief Judge of the Trial Court of D.C. I'm so grateful to all of you. I thank Judge Thompson again, and Clerk of Court Trey uh, Granger, because they really made this very possible to add on other seminars so that we could all celebrate the history of the Civil Rights Movement the court's relationship to the movement, as well as the current state of affairs in civil rights litigation. And wow, we get to do it in this beautiful First Baptist Church of Montgomery. When I found out that I would be speaking here, I thought about wearing my robe. <laughs> but I didn't want this to be confused with a sermon for which I am duly not qualified to give. <laughs> but wow. What an honor it is to be in this historic church, formerly led by Ralph Abernathy, a civil rights activist. These stained glass windows and the high arch ceiling, they tell us a story. In the late 19th century, long before the civil rights movement, black worshipers sought refuge right here. In this space, despite initially not being fully welcomed, Indeed, before the Civil War, black worshipers were prohibited from entering the main floor unless they were sweeping or mopping. Instead, they took to the only place they were allowed in the church, the balcony. In 1866, fed up with a segregated worship place, they founded what has become known as the First Baptist Church of Montgomery in an empty parking lot. The fruits of their courage fortify the church we sit here today, more than 150 years later. 
And as we know, churches function as safe havens, and they were the center of the black community and still serve as such in many respects. They stood as the foundation of black, religious, political, economic, cultural, and social life. It was the source of identity for our communities when the outside world tried to crush your spirit. It was a place to deliver not only spiritual messages as the center of worship, but also the plans for coordinated actions in response to civil rights violations. If these walls could talk, they would tell you another story key to this church's history. In 1961, racial divisions bubbled up in response to a controversial holding by the United States Supreme Court. In Boynton versus Virginia, issued a year earlier, the court held that segregated public buses were unconstitutional. But the southern states ignored the rulings, as they later would do in response to Brown versus Board of Education, with all deliberate speed. And what became their rallying moniker, the Freedom Riders, a group of civil rights activists who challenged the non-enforcement of the Supreme Court's decision, gathered white and black people alike on the same bus to protest the southern state's reluctance to follow the rule of law. The first Freedom Riders left from Washington, D.C. on May 4, 1961. For the next year, 60 rides with more than 400 riders met the angry protesters defiant of the Supreme Court's decision. Emboldened by their plan to desegregate, the riders sat two by two on the bus with a person of a different race on either side. But outside the bus, violence awaited their journey. When the riders arrived in Birmingham, they met the Ku Klux Klan who violently beat the riders with baseball bats, iron pipes, and bicycle chains. Then Attorney General Robert Kennedy urged the riders to cease their expedition. Yet they continued to Montgomery under the leadership of the great late Congressman John Lewis. Before the congressman even coined the phrase, they were getting into good trouble. On May 21, 1961, after two days of intense beating, state-issued police escorts and white mob attacks on Freedom Riders, this church became a refuge. More than 1,500 people packed these pews. The Montgomery and Alabama State Police failed to quell the more than 3,000 white people who waited outside the church to bomb it. They were even throwing stones through the windows of the church. Unbothered by the threat of violence outside, civil rights leaders girded the parishioners with the righteousness of their desegregationist cause and the sanctity of their nonviolent response. They gathered in song and prayer. Remember the joys and hopes of those spiritual melodies. Go tell it on the mountain. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Come by me, Lord, come by me. Oh, freedom. He's got the whole world in his hands, and of course, we shall overcome. Among the speakers in the church that day was none other than the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So no pressure for me here tonight. <laughs> Reverend Dr. King was no stranger to Montgomery. As many of you know, in 1954, he became the pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church just down the road. But he stayed involved in this community. One year after he became pastor, Reverend Dr. King spoke at the Montgomery bus boycott, delivering one of his first major addresses, while informing those in the attendance of the arrest of Rosa Parks. He also let those in attendance be reminded of their American citizenship, their love for democracy, and tiredness of being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression, the abyss of humiliation, and the bleakness of nagging despair. Unlike the Montgomery bus boycott, what was special about Reverend Dr. King's presence in this church in 1961 during those Freedom Riders movements was not his words, but his courage. 
Indeed, historians remember the mob violence in Montgomery and this church because in the basement, Reverend Dr. King, the late Congressman Lewis, and others took a phone call from Attorney General Kennedy to strategize about how to calm the violence that day. Kennedy asked John Malcolm Patterson, then Alabama's governor, to de-escalate the tensions. But when Governor Patterson failed to do so timely, Reverend Dr. King did something perhaps more notable than delighting this church with his words. He designated 10 or 12 volunteers to escort him through the white mob outside to prevent more violence. Reverend Dr. King's response and his purpose was to deter the black taxi drivers from engaging in violent efforts to avenge the riders inside by attacking the mob. He was successful and escaped the mob unscathed. Hence the beginnings of his urgings for nonviolent protests, even in the face of threatening action by others. Because of Reverend Dr. King and others' fearlessness, the flock of this church was battered, but not broken on that infamous day. Reverend Dr. King possessed that same type of courage that preachers, community organizers, lawyers, and judges have exhibited all the time, as we have been at the forefront of the movement for social justice and equality. And while we may have different lenses from which we look to resolve issues, we do so with the understanding of our different roles, respectfully, humbled by our passion for public service and gratified by our concern for humanity and our communities. I am so honored to speak in these hallowed halls. Now, as an additional preference for my remarks, let me remind you that the preamble of the Constitution of the United States proclaims, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Yet it had been obvious throughout the 19th century that we did not include African American persons inhabiting the lands of the United States. The actions of the United States Congress during the Reconstruction era attempted to protect those freedoms of African Americans in the South after the Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863, which stated that all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. When Congress eventually passed the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery, the 14th Amendment to grant American citizenship to persons born or naturalized in the United States, and to provide due process and equal protection of the laws, the 15th Amendment to grant African Americans the right to vote, Congress intended to establish the freedom of African Americans, declare them true citizens of the United States, and to create equal opportunities for those previously held in bondage. During the racial evolution of the South, there was a slight calmness as African Americans merged into the working class. For the first time in history, they began voting, were elected to various positions in government in large numbers, including the U.S. House of Representatives. They were appointed as trial judges, jury commissioners, and members of county and state commissions. They began to enjoy equal access to public accommodations and public educations as facilities began to become integrated. But not long thereafter, African American citizens were systemically denied the rights secured by these Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution as Jim Crow and Black Codes emerged and relegated African Americans to the status of inferior citizens as segregation re-emerged. So how fitting, the namesake of this lecture series are Clifford and Virginia Durr. 
They embody not only the legacy of this church in the lives they lived, but in their efforts to improve the standards of living for African Americans. If you were to look at the early lives of Clifford and Virginia Durr on paper, however, you might be surprised that history remembers them for their civil rights advocacy. Clifford Durr was born in 1899 to an upper-class Montgomery family with deep roots in Alabama. Both of his grandfathers were Confederate captains during the Civil War. Similarly, Virginia was also born in Alabama, but just up the road in Birmingham. One of her grandfathers owned a plantation and slaves, while the other was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. But education transformed the, transformed the Durr's worldviews. After attending school at Montgomery, Clifford graduated as class president from the University of Alabama and earned a law degree from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. And Virginia went off to Wellesley College in Massachusetts, where she was forced to comply with the college's rotating tables policy in the dining hall. That policy required students to eat meal with random students, regardless of race. So although some might consider it forced interaction, you see how early this intermingling among the races opened their vision about the treatment of others. As Virginia married Clifford, and while raising five children, she stayed active in local politics in Alabama that promoted racial, economic, and social equality. In 1933, after Clifford took posts at the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and the Federal Communications Commission, Virginia got involved in local politics in the Washington, D.C. area. She joined the Women's National Democratic Club and began a long campaign to abolish the poll tax which prevented many African Americans from voting. She was also a founding member of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, an interracial group that fought to reduce segregation and improve living conditions in the South. In other words, Virginia was not a sideliner, simply remaining hopeful for a better future for other races. Throughout their marriage, Virginia and Clifford shared a commitment to civil rights. In 1942, when Clifford was placed under FBI surveillance for defending a colleague accused of left-wing political association, then under the Truman administration, he resigned for refusing to adopt the loyalty oath order, which was designed to root out communism in the federal government. But he continued representing those federal employees who had lost their job due to the loyalty oath program free of charge. Thereafter, they moved to Colorado, but before then, Virginia ran for the U.S. Senate as a member of the progressive ticket. And then Virginia continued to expand her political involvement, including becoming a member of the National Committee for the Abolition of Poll Tax, engaging in political activities that carried professional consequences for both Clifford and her. But nothing could deter her commitment to equality for all. They shared that. They met a young black no lawyer and preacher named Fred Gray from the NAACP. They went on to represent black citizens whose rights were violated here in Alabama. They had prepared to represent Claudette Colvin, a pregnant 15-year-old African-American girl who was charged with violating Montgomery's bus segregation laws. In recognition that the media would unfairly scrutinize Claudette, Fred and Clifford, along with other black activists, decided that her case just was not the case to challenge those bus segregation laws. However, their efforts were not in vain. As you recall, in December 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white man on the orders of the bus driver. Now, while many accounts suggest that she was tired and her feet were hurting, she claims that she was only tired of giving in to legally imposed racial segregation. The Durrs, along with Edie Nixon, another prominent member of the civil rights movement, bailed out Rosa Parks and immediately prepared to fight the charges, believing that they had now found the right plaintiff. Clifford and Gray represented Rosa in the criminal appeals in the state, which would become one of the most important cases in Alabama during the Civil Rights Movement. 
Virginia met Rosa Parks through Edie Nixon, and then they worked during that time with the NAACP. They employed her as a part-time seamstress. She sold for Virginia and her children, and after a while, Virginia considered Parks a close friend. Years later, they collaborated with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and she advocated for legislation to eliminate the poll tax. And through those joint efforts, they required uh, the support to adopt the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So these DERS are emblematic of courageous but unsung heroes of the Civil Rights Movement. These are people whose contributions are significant, but they receive little contemporaneous recognition for it. So now, returning to Dr. King, gracing this church's congregation with his wisdom, he truly understood the role of the courts in the civil rights movement and professed his understanding of that role time and time again. In his 1957 speech, Dr. King described depriving one of their ability to have their day in court as a shameful compounding of basic rights and a mockery of citizenship. He even predicted that courts would remain an essential ingredient in the civil rights movement because lawyers throughout the land, yesterday and today, have helped clear the obstructions, have helped eliminate roadblocks by their selfless, courageous espousal of difficult and unpopular causes. But what many of us may be unaware of, of those who work behind the scenes and were equally instrumental to such progress. Despite their actions not being praised, they were significant, and they shall be given their due credit this evening. I call out Ella Baker, who helped organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and was also a founding member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Her direct actions included mentoring and training young activists. Her work earned her the nickname Fundi, Swahili for a person who teaches a craft to the next generation. I call out Bayer Rustin. He played a significant role in organizing the March on Washington in 1963 yet he was not honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom until 2013 by President Obama. He, like Baker, avoided the spotlight and helped to organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but is also credited with introducing Dr. King to Gandhi's nonviolent teachings. Then there is Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray, the iconic Howard Law alum, legal theorist, human rights activist, an Episcopalian priest. She encountered much difficulty in her journey as a lawyer and activist. In fact, in 1944, when Polly Murray applied to Harvard Law School, she was informed by the admission committee that her gender made her ineligible for admission. But that did not stop her. She was the first African-American woman to receive a law degree from Howard and Yale Law School. She even founded the National Organization for Women. So along the way, she kept contributing to the civil rights movement to desegregate public education. Thurgood Marshall's team even relied on her student legal paper developing the argument for Brown v. Board of Education. As a third year Howard Law student in 1944, her paper contended that segregation was in and of itself unequal without any regard to any attempts to make separate facilities equal. And long after Murray's death, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg also disclosed that she too relied on Murray's work in an amicus brief she wrote in Reed v. Reed, a Supreme Court case that was the first time the nation's highest court recognized women as victims of sex discrimination. Far from the spotlight, these individuals had the courage to do the work necessary to turn the wheels of the movement. Their work was not glorious, but necessary. It was thankless, but crucial. And in the end, their work was undoubtedly consequential. So using that framework of unsung heroes, I challenge us all to consider another unsung, but courageous group in the civil rights movement, federal judges in the South. 
I want to impress upon you that without these seven Southern judges' fidelity to the law in the face of violence between the 1940s and the 1970s, pre and post Brown, the driving force of the civil rights movement to end racial discrimination may not have been realized. They were tested throughout history, but acted with courage and conviction irrespective of the civil unrest that threatened their own lives and their families. But even so, they made those unpopular decisions in their role as the independent decision makers in the third co-equal branch of the government. That is the awesome role that judges play in our constitutional order, to be neutral arbiters of the law, upholding equal justice under the law, and thereby changing the trajectory of the civil rights movement in America despite the turbulent times. That is why Lady Justice, who is sketched in the Supreme Court's marble facade, wears a blindfold. It is not to imply that she cannot see. Of course she has sight and she can see the world around her. It is also not to imply that she cannot hear. Surely she can. Judges, after all, are human beings who are citizens of society. Rather, the blindfold she wears is symbolic of one of the tasks that our founders charged us with, to put aside our biases, beliefs, worldviews, politics, influences, and sympathies in every case we hear. But Lady Justice also holds number, another symbol in her right hand, a scale. What tips the scale, though? It is not the status of the litigants before us, nor is the status of the lawyers who argue, although some lawyers may think otherwise. No, what tips the scales are the facts, the law, and the arguments by the parties. That is it, nothing more, nothing less. So let's consider first Judge Wadey's wearing of the South Carolina District Court, whose courage was evident well before Brown. My dear friend and colleague, Judge Richard Gergel, has commemorated Judge Waring's life in his excellent book, Unexampled Courage, The Blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard and the Awakening of President Harry S. Truman and Judge J. Wadey Waring. Like that free marketing? <laughs> Before Judge Waring became a judge, he was the son of a Confederate soldier. After being appointed to the federal bench by President Roosevelt in 1942, no one could have predicted that he would become a civil rights hero considering his upbringing. In 1947, when Judge Waring presided over a voting rights case that challenged the South Carolina Democratic Party's prohibition on black participation, people predicted how the judge would resolve the case, but he shocked the public. He ruled that the Democratic Party was not a private club and therefore not exempt from the 14th Amendment's protections from discrimination based on race. The public reacted viciously. Shortly after that decision, crosses were burned in his yard, rocks were thrown through his windows, one magazine even labeled him as the lonesomest man in town. But in the face of violence, Judge Waring continued to show up to court each and every day. In 1951, before Brown was law, he dissented from a two-page panel decision that upheld school segregation. That case, Briggs versus Elliott, was the first case in the 20th century to challenge the constitutionality of racially segregated schools. He wrote that when the United States adopted the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, it cannot be denied that the basic reason for all these amendments to the Constitution was to wipe out completely the institution of slavery and to declare that all citizens in this country should be considered as free, equal, and entitled to all of the provisions of citizenship. He went on to conclude that segregation is per se inequality. Judge Waring's dissent helped influence the unanimous majority opinion in Brown v. Board of Education, and that changed the landscape in what many believe is the most courageous decision in U.S. history. Then later, Judge Waring was ostracized for his decision and forced to move out of South Carolina. 
but proudly, South Carolina bears a courthouse in its honor. In 1954, the Brown decision led to significant civil unrest in states operating segregated schools and colleges. Those who supported integration, including black and non-black individuals, suffered from violence, harassment, and intimidation for trying to adhere to federal mandates. Soon after the Brown decision in 1954, President Eisenhower appointed Judge Frank Johnson, Jr the United States District Court for the Middle District of Alabama. Judge Johnson was a white man who grew up in a segregated environment and th that desired to remain that way. His hometown was Haleyville, Alabama, and they were known as a small town with an independent mind. His primary school classmate was George C. Wallace, the infamous 45th governor of Alabama who staunchly favored Jim Crow laws and opposed desegregation. But Judge Johnson, after serving in World War II, where he chose to stand up for prisoners of war by accusing one general and a commanding colonel for failing to carry out their duties, he returned to Alabama with a newfound sense of patriotism and a voice for the voiceless. He became active in politics that were pro desegregation, and after he was appointed to the bench, he maintained his independence. In 1956, just one year after becoming a federal judge, Judge Johnson ordered that the public buses in Montgomery be desegregated, which spurred the start of constant political attacks. Judge Johnson ruled that the city's bus segregation violated the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution extending the reasoning of Brown to public accommodations. He later upheld voting rights for Tuskegee, Alabama, ordered the integration of public schools in Macon, Alabama, and mandated that all voters in Selma, Alabama, be allowed to register to vote. And then those swift attacks followed. In the 1960s, critics burned a cross on his lawn. They also bombed his mother's house, mistaking it for his. And after several death threats, he received around-the-clock protection from federal marshals. Yet in a 1977 lecture delivered at the University of Georgia Law School, unbothered, the judge said, courts do not relish making such hard decisions and certainly do not encourage litigation on social or political problems. But, I repeat, the federal judiciary in this country has the paramount and the continuing duty to uphold the law. And for 44 years, until Judge Johnson retired in 1999, he upheld the law in every case. And he courageously held fidelity to the Constitution as a protector of individual rights and liberty, liberties. Deservedly so, the federal courthouse down the street is named in his honor. On February 1, 1956, civil rights lawyer Fred Gray and Charles Langford filed a suit in the Middle District of Alabama challenging Alabama state statutes and Montgomery city ordinances requiring segregate, segregated seating. Gray and Langford filed the lawsuit as a class action on behalf of Aurelia Broder, who I had the pleasure of meeting their granddaughter last night, four other plaintiffs and all similarly situated black citizens in Montgomery. In their three-judge panel decision, sitting by designation, Judge Reeves held that Montgomery's ordinances and Alabama's laws requiring segregated seating were unconstitutional. He traced the many civil rights opinions that led to the enshrinement of separate but equal until its unfolding in the 20th century. Judge Reed said he could not in good conscience perform their duty, allowing judges to blindly follow the precedent of Plessy v. Ferguson, which though overruled in the education context, could also not validly apply to the public carrier con uh, transportation context. Following that decision, he experienced anything but support, although the United States Supreme Court affirmed the decision. As reported by the Washington Post in an article titled, He Makes the Right Enemies, 
when Judge Reeves and his wife sat down in their pews at church, parishioners simultaneously rose and moved away. The luncheon club for Judge Reeves' weekly lawyers meeting changed the location without notifying him. And speakers at the Alabama State Bar Association banquet referred to their former president as our ex-friend. Yet when confronted about how it felt to be shunned by those he had known for so long because of his vote, Judge Reeves responded only that he felt sorry for those who shunned him. And he went on to author many more critical and courageous decisions. In other words, he kept ensuring equal justice under the law. And after Brown was issued in 1954, Hamilton Holmes and Charlene Hunter applied for admission to the University of Georgia, but their applications were denied because of their race. So Judge Albert Tuttle held that the University of Georgia must admit Holmes and Hunter. The Supreme Court affirmed. This was a ruling, a significant victory for civil rights movement and African American students at that time. Judge Tuttle, too, faced public dis disapproval and experienced numerous personal attacks and threats of physical violence. And in 1980, Judge Tuttle received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian or, uh, honor in the United States in recognition of that contribution to civil rights. Judge John Minor Wisdom joined Judge Tuttle on the Fifth Circuit and they quickly became ideologically synced. But a few years on the bench, he too faced acts of violence. Protester poisoned two of Wisdom's dogs, threw rattlesnakes into the garden in New Orleans, and placed threatening phone calls. Despite this, Judge Wisdom upheld the law. He went on to order desegregation of the public parts in New Orleans and admitted blacks to southern juries, voting booths, and state legislators. Notably, he uh, struck down that Louisiana statute requiring black voters to interpret difficult passages from the Constitution to prevent them from voting. He also received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And unlike his colleagues in the Fifth Circuit, Judge John R. Brown was not known as a civil rights hero, and as a result, he did not face violent threats that his colleagues did. But in consequential cases, he still upheld the law, and then he allowed the desegregation of schools in Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi. These judges became affectionately known as the Fifth Circuit Four. Um, they were admitted against, admittedly against civil rights laws and any regressions at that particular time. And they all had an unwavering commitment to uphold the rule of law. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not mention one of my mentors, Judge Matthew J. Perry. He was appointed to the District Court for South Carolina in 1979, making history as the state's first black federal judge. More than 20 years after Brown, Judge Perry was crucial in carrying out its command. Before he was appointed to the federal bench in 1976, he was a passionate civil rights lawyer and a champion for the underserved and disadvantaged. Despite himself as a civil rights lawyer, being denied equal access to the very courtrooms that he then became a judge, through his legal advocacy, he fought for social justice in areas affecting basic human and civil rights, racial injustices, and equal opportunity. In fact, he individually tried more than 6,000 cases, and his work led to the release of nearly 7,000 people arrested for protesting various forms of segregation. Among his most notable cases, in 1963, he successfully litigated the integration of Clemson University, as well as the University of South Carolina and other public institutions. He appealed many unfavorable rulings as a lawyer, and he was asked, how do you approach incivility among lawyers and continue on for your causes? And he responded, I don't conform myself to their conduct or their approaches. Much of what I do and what I say to deal I do it in my own terms, armed with the Constitution. Perry was endearingly referred to as the Thurgood Marshal of the South, but as a result of the civil rights work implementing the rule of Brown, 
Judge Perry, like the six judges I highlighted before him, received threats to his livelihood by telephone and mail. Critics also burned a cross in his yard, which Judge Perry described it as the spirit of the times. But Judge Perry, too, held to his constitutional oath to do equal justice under the law. In his own words, like Reverend Dr. King, Perry hoped that our state and our nation and our government will continue to correct all ills of the past and will judge people on the basis of their quality and qualifications rather than on the basis of the color of their skin and that the court system itself continue to demonstrate its capacity to accommodate the needs and the aspirations of all the people in our country. So these unsung seven judges are indeed fearless arbiters of the law. Without them contributing to Brown and implementing Brown some 20 years later, desegregation may not have spread throughout the South. They acted as a fierce firewall to Southern defiance of the Supreme Court, and each of them is deserving of their respective places in civil rights history. Indeed, the courageous but the unsung legacy lives on in many judges sitting on the federal bench today. And so I focused on Southern judges who had a role in the civil rights movement, but tonight I also wish to honor my new friend and judicial luminary, Myron Thompson. He succeeded Frank Johnson Jr. at the young age of 33 in the Middle District of Alabama, right here in Montgomery. No doubt Judge Thompson has continued Judge Johnson's legacy. His rulings are indeed a model of fairness and impartiality. To recount just some of Judge Thompson's past cases, he has ordered HIV positive prisoners to be integrated with other inmates, ruled in favor of desegregation of Alabama state troopers, held that using a hitching post in the Alabama prison system constituted cruel and unusual punishment, and it eliminated at-large voting systems in Alabama for county commissioners and other local elections. And that was all in a day's work. <laughs> Incredibly, he still maintains a full caseload as an endearing, true public servant. So as I have started my new role as a judge on the DC Circuit, which many describe as the second highest court in our nation, I recently retook the judicial oath. And I was honored to have Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson administer that oath to me in a crowd of hundreds as a witness. I pledged, after more than 12 years as a district judge and four years as a state court judge, to uphold the rule of law. I was reminded of that awesome responsibility and that commitment while repeating the oath. It is not some combination of some lofty words. It is a commitment primarily for three reasons. First, it reminds all judges that their principal responsibility is to execute their assigned duties without fear and to the best of our ability. Second, the oath emphasizes that judges do not swear allegiance to politicians, but to the U.S. Constitution. Finally, it bonds all judges in unity and allegiance to the principles of equality and justice for all. If I can have half the courage of those seven unsung judges, and of course, dear friend Myron Thompson, the other individuals identified here tonight as well, I believe I will have garnered the courage of the black worshipers of this church who founded this majestic church. Unbeknownst to them, their legacy inspired a generation. Their personal costs were certainly great, but the benefit to this country was even greater. So at a time when public confidence is so low in our courts and it's very concerning, I hope these judges' courage and competence that the rule of law should never, ever bend to fear or favor. Thank you.